Hey everybody, since I recently added a new massive storage server to my home lab and I'm currently migrating all my data to it, I thought it's a great idea to make a video about storage and containers. Because probably most of you run containerized applications in your home labs, at least I hope that. If not, you might need to check out some of my other videos about Docker and Kubernetes. Anyway, in this one I want to show you how to store Docker volumes on remote NFS storage server. And this is perfect if you're running a small Raspberry Pi Docker server that has a great storage solution itself, or even a self-hosted Kubernetes cluster where you actually need a central storage provider. But it can also make sense in case of single Docker server setup that you're running on a virtual or physical machine, because separating your container workflows from the data storage that has many advantages over local docker volumes or binds into the host's file system. This is by the way also a concept that's used in data centers where large server environments traditionally use network storage devices. And this concept is something you can actually practice in your own home lab, maybe at a smaller scale, but it really does matter because the technologies are pretty similar. So let's start and migrate your local docker volumes into a network storage. Let me first point out that if you're running a single Docker server and storing your volumes locally, this isn't a terrible thing. So you can still do this when you have a proper backup for the server. But let me also explain why it can have many advantages to not store the volumes locally and use a separate storage system instead. Of course, what you need for this is a Linux machine where you're running your containerized workflows and applications in Docker. And in the past, I've stored the data for these applications and containers in persistent volumes or bindings onto the local host's file system. And that works pretty well and is very easy to do, but if anything happens with the server, you might want to replace it or you lose data on it, the data in the container volumes and consequently in the applications is also lost. Sure, you can always back up uh, the persistent volumes or the entire server itself, but that can be sometimes annoying to do for every single volume, especially when you're running databases inside them. Because if you just copy the databases away, without creating a proper dump job, the data might get corrupted or inconsistent. It always complicates things if you're dealing with databases. So why store the content of the Docker volume onto the server where you're running a workload? Instead, let's connect the volume to a separate storage server and use the NFS protocol to read and write the data over the network. And that works pretty well in Docker because you can just create volumes with the NFS option that automatically connects to a remote server and mount a specific path into the container's file system. Then you can just use a remote server's file system just like it would be on the local host. And the only thing that you need, obviously, is a separate storage server that runs the NFS protocol and allows you to access it over the network. And if you're now wondering what that particular storage server could be, here you have many different options you can use in your home network. For example, the storage server can be a small Synology or QNAP NAS, a Linux server that's just running NFS. It doesn't really matter what you're using because NFS, which stands for Network File System, this is a standardized protocol that all Linux machines understand and it's built into nearly every NAS operating system. Okay, so using an NFS server gives us a couple of advantages, like whenever something goes wrong in the Docker server itself, all the critical files on the remote server are still there. But it can also simplify the whole backup strategy, because if you're using a NAS system like TrueNAS or Synology, these systems usually have their own backup mechanisms, like snapshots to take periodic backups of the entire file system, or they can also mirror the data by using multiple hard drives and software RAIDs. For example, in TrueNAS, I'm running a RAID Z1 pool with 12 4 terabyte hard drives, which is much more reliable than a single HDD on my Docker server. And I've also configured a regular snapshot task that retains the state of the entire storage pool, where the data is always stored and retained for two weeks. Now, I don't want this to be a NAS or storage video, but I hope you agree with me that a NAS system, when it's properly configured, is the best and easiest way to build a reliable storage system for your home lab. And that's why I'm also using it to store my Docker volumes. Okay, so that is the concept. Let's now take a look at the TrueNAS server and what I've configured here. So if you're not running TrueNAS, by the way, you can still follow these steps because they should also work the same way or in a similar way on another NAS operating system. First, you need to enable the NFS servers if it's not running and configure some basic options for it. I've bound the NFS server to the private IP address of my TrueNAS machine and enabled the NFS protocol in version 4. This isn't actually a requirement, 
but uh, because we're using the NFS protocol version 4 in the Docker volumes later, of course these two settings need to match on the server and the client. So that's why I have enabled it here. Then in the main menu I've created a new share and the path is the location that should be accessible for the Docker server. On TrueNAS you can choose a ZFS storage pool, in my case the pool store, which is located in the mount directory. And here I have created a new folder which is called NFS and another one for my Docker volumes. Next you need to specify the IP address of your Docker server, so where the connection is initiated from. You can specify even entire networks to permit access from multiple hosts, but I would limit the access as much as possible because there is no other authentication or protection enabled by default in NFS, so only the IP address. So I just entered the private IP address of my Docker server here, but that's mainly all to configure an NFS server. The protocol version is important, the IP address or the network, and the Linux user permissions, but I will show you that in a second how it works. First I want to say a few words about a secure server access and the sponsor of this video, Teleport, because if you want to protect your home lab or professional server environments with two-factor authentication and in audit logging, you should use the open source access plane Teleport. It can protect SSH servers, databases, web applications, Kubernetes clusters or remote desktop servers. It's completely free to use in the community version, so just download and try it out. I've done a full video and tutorial about Teleport in the past, so you will find that with the link to their website in the video description as well. Okay, so let's go back to Docker and NFS and to enable the NFS functionalities on your Docker server, you should have installed the NFS utilities. On my server, I just connected via SSH to it and installed it through the package manager of Ubuntu. So in Ubuntu, you should always update your packages and install the package nfs-common. So this will install the NFS client on your server so that the Docker daemon can open a connection to your remote storage system. And let's now open the web UI of Portana on my Docker server, where I can show you how I've configured the volumes. So if you haven't seen Portana before, you should check it out. <laughs> because you can still configure and manage a Docker server in the CLI and configure NFS volumes there as well. But in Portana, it's actually much easier to manage and configure it. So let's start with creating a new volume here. For a short demonstration, I just gave it a test name and enabled the feature use NFS volume. Then you can enter the IP address of your NAS system or NFS server that you want to connect to and select the correct NFS protocol version. I use the default version 4 which I have enabled in TrueNAS already so that should work. And the mount point needs to be the exact file path on the remote server's file system. So you need to start with a root directory and enter the full path, not just the folder existing in the share. It's also important that this folder already should exist on the NFS server before using the volume, otherwise the container might not start. You can also specify or customize options for this NFS volume, so in my case the standard values always worked without any issues, so I didn't need to change or add anything here. And when you create this, you can see the message volume created successfully. But uh, that doesn't really mean the connection is working, it just means the volume was created. The connection is only initiated once you start using this volume in a container. So let's do this and create a test container that will use this NFS volume. And to do that, I've created a new test container with an Ubuntu image where I selected the interactive and TDY console option. So that allows me to run a simple Linux container and open a terminal window inside to test the NFS mount point on a remote NFS server. So in the volume section, you can just select this NFS volume and mount it into the container's file system by using a mount point. For example, something like a slash NFS. And then you can deploy the container and open a console window. And here inside the shell of the container, you should see the directory slash NFS. I just created a simple test file here. And now when I connect a second shell on the TrueNAS NFS server, we should also see the file here as well. So you can see the container's volume is actually writing to the file system on the remote NFS server. Sometimes you might see permission errors when you create or change a file inside the NFS volume. And I think I need to explain this because it might be confusing. So the NFS protocol doesn't have a user or password authentication, it's just based on IP addresses. But the Linux user permissions in the file system 
are still relevant. So that means when the directory on the NFS server is owned by the root user and doesn't have write permissions for other users, that is also the case for the containers file system. And when you start the container with a different user ID that doesn't have permissions on the remote file system, you can't access it. So this is the first thing you always need to check. So if the permissions on the remote server match the user ID you start the container with. But in my case, I still had permission errors, although I'm running the container as a root user. And that has confused me a little because it actually worked in the previous version of TrueNAS. But after an update, it suddenly didn't work anymore. However, I was able to fix this by enabling a setting inside the NFS share on TrueNAS. And this is hidden in the advanced options and called user mapping. Here I just entered root in the map root user setting and then it worked. <laughs> I think it is okay to do it this way in a home lab situation, but on a production system, you might want to create a separate user that exists on both servers and that has the same user ID and limited privileges. And then you can also use the map functions in the advanced sections to enforce a specific user permissions to read and write the NFS servers directory, and then you should have access to it. And now, when you want to migrate the data from your local Docker volumes into the NFS volume, I've done it this way. I've stopped the container I wanted to migrate the data from and started a new test container with the Ubuntu image and mounted both the old and the new volume inside this container. I just gave the new volume a different name and started the container with these settings. Then you can just copy the files from one folder to another. It is important that the original container is stopped because if you do a migration while the application is running, you might not copy all the files or you have inconsistencies. So if you're doing it with a separate container, that's definitely the better and the safe option. And then when the migration is done, when you have copied all the files, you can then start the original container again and just change the volume from the old one to the new NFS volume. And then it should have all the same data and it should be using the location or the remote storage system. So overall, besides some confusion about the user permissions I had, the process was pretty easy. And now I'm happy to have all my Docker volumes stored on the remote storage server. They are now included in the storage server's backup procedure. And whenever something goes wrong with the Docker server on my home lab, the data is still in the cloud and I can just easily make a disaster recovery of the entire system. So I hope this was a bit helpful to you guys and stay tuned for more home lab and storage videos. I'm planning to do a deep dive into TrueNAS and how to use it as a storage system with 10 gigabit connected to my virtual machine. So this will be a lot of fun. And as always, thanks everybody for watching. I will catch you in the next video. Take care. Bye bye.